Hey everybody, welcome to week 9 of the study of the history of the church from 33 to 1500 AD. So again, we are picking up in the midst of where we left off last time, which was a couple weeks ago, uh, talking about how the um, how the the Roman Empire essentially fell in the West and how the last emperor is deposed and uh, is uh, sort of in a position where Rome is without a leader, at least a, a noted leader. And this is all going to play a role in how we'll see that, that a new order is essentially established in the West. Now next week we'll talk more about how the Western and the Eastern Roman Empire come to a disagreement. We'll sort of allude to it a good bit this week, especially in the first two lectures. But we want to note a couple of things about the uh, really our topic for this week. And the first topic we're going to break down into two separate videos. Um, and the first one considers how the Bishop of Rome essentially becomes the Pope, as we sort of understand the term today. And especially how the, uh, the office of the Pope operated in the uh, Middle Ages or um, Europe from about 700 to roughly uh, 1500 really uh, AD and there are two ways that we want to look at this and this is how we're going to divide the lecture videos first we're going to talk about in this lecture video how the Bishop of Rome gains religious power uh, throughout Western Europe and one of the things that we'll see is that this is not a process that happens overnight. Uh, likewise, it's going to be the same way with how the Pope gains political power in the western portion of, the, uh, of Europe and really, in a way, takes the place of the, um, in some ways, takes the place of what the Roman Emperor in the West essentially used to be. And that'll be the second lecture video. And then the third video, we're just going to talk about how monasticism continues and we'll talk about uh, Benedict and and some of his rules within that um, within that lecture video, which will be the last for this week. So let's talk about how the Bishop of Rome essentially gains religious power. So again, we keep in mind that within all of this, the Roman Emperor in the West has uh, essentially fallen or been deposed by 476 A.D. Again, that was Romulus, as we talked about last time, and. So you've got a, a, a really a position of leadership that's opened up in the uh, in the city and throughout a lot of the areas in the West that still look to Rome as sort of being the center for uh, organization and authority and things like that. And you know this is not just the case of where one leader has stepped down and it's expected for a new leader to sort of step up. You're talking about the entire system of government in a sense is in flux or it, or it might be. Um, or it's in jeopardy of being destroyed. And we might think of this like not as a president stepping down or resigning um, sort of unexpectedly. Um, that's not really how we should think of it. We should think of it in the sense of our own government just one day dissolving. And there's no leadership, no structure that's sort of set in place for how society should go on and, and really who holds the ultimate authority. Well, it's sort of the same way with the Roman Empire at the time. There's no established authority with the emperor being deposed uh, and it's in, it's especially uh, sort of detailed or, or brought to light as you've got these Germanic tribes that are invading into some of uh, Italy and some of the, the places in Western Europe. Um, so within that let's talk about the name Pope itself and and the word itself just simply means uh, Papa or Father and generally it's a uh, it didn't begin as an exclusive title per se. There were uh, several individuals that could hold the title of Pope or Father of Papa, um, and it, it didn't really matter. It was regardless of location. So, for instance, we talked about Cyprian of Carthage before. Um, well, there are documents that where Cyprian of Carthage, who is not the Bishop of Rome, was called Pope uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire. You've got um, you, you've got different bishops there in, in in some of those important cities, and at times they could be referred to as pope. And so early on, the the title pope was sort of uh, was not a very exclusive title. Different men could hold hold the title, um, and this would definitely continue on in the east. 
And then within that, we want to talk about really the origins of the, the papacy, um, which again, that just refers to the Pope and, and the things regarding the Pope. We always want to keep in mind with any of this, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not one day, and it's not like we can point to one specific day and say, you know, this is when the Bishop of Rome became the Pope. Just sort of like you can't point to, it's really hard to point to one day and say, well, this is the official date when the Catholic Church started because it was sort of a process of things happening over the centuries following the establishment of the Church. And so within the origins of the papacy, we want to talk about what uh, you might be familiar with, the, the importance of Peter. Of course, a lot of this is what, we're, what, what I'm reiterating here, maybe, is, is what's said about Peter in connection to uh, the Pope. Um, and, and as we're going to know, there's some historians that are, are, um, have pointed out some inconsistencies about the, uh, the study of this, at least in uh, uh, Catholicism's explanation of this. All right, so the importance of Peter. So it was said that within his last years that he lived in the city of Rome and that he was ultimately buried there. Um, there was a, a church building, uh, a basilica, that was built in the 1500s called the Basilica of St. Peter. And it was said that it was built on top of the catacombs where uh, a lot of early Christians had died. And it turns out that there was a field uh, nearby where the, the church building was, was built. And within that field, there was a special wall that had been separated off from the rest of the graveyard. And during the 1940s, the archaeologists, when they're examining that wall, they find a small niche or, an, or a small uh, cut for an opening in the wall. And in that opening, they find uh, a box that, that had been sort of sealed off. And it was thought that that box contained the contents of Peter's body. And they went and they opened up the box, and as you might guess, there was nothing found in it. Um, but it was thought that at one point there was, there was a box that contained Peter's bones, and it was thought that maybe the, the archaeologists in the 1940s had discovered that. Uh, but this was a very important place to Christians, the city of Rome, because Peter had been buried there, supposedly. Um, likewise, Paul... Uh, it's thought that he died and was was buried there as well. So Rome was 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 seen as a very important city. And if you go into the Peter, if you go into the Basilica of Peter, uh, yeah, the Basilica of, of Saint Peter today in Rome, you can see a statue of both Paul and Rome within that uh, basilica. And I may I don't have this pulled up right now, but I may pull that up in the second lecture video for you to look at. Um, so again, Peter is connected to the city of Rome. It's obviously through Peter that the Bishop of Rome sort of derives his power in Catholicism. There are also certain passages in the New Testament that are, are very important to look at that are often used to defend the papacy. Again, you know, we, we look at John chapter 21, 15 through 19. In that passage, you know, Jesus on uh, reiterates three three separate uh, you know ask uh, Peter the question you know do you love me more than these uh, and then three times Jesus says feed my sheep and uh, this passage was used to show Peter's uh, some have argued that this passage shows Peter's importance over the apostles um, I'm sure we're familiar with Matthew chapter 16 13 through 19 where um, Again, where you know Peter makes a confession, Jesus said that upon this rock I will build my church. Um, whereas rock really refers to probably Peter's conf it does refer to Peter's confession. Versus you know within Catholicism, it, it's sort of looked at as the the rock there is Peter, and that the church will be built on Peter himself, his body. Um, uh, which again we'll note that consistency inconsistency in a minute. Um, but that's an important passage. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul goes to Jerusalem. Uh, I believe he goes to Jerusalem, and he notes that Peter was a pillar in the church there. Um, and, and again, within those passages, you know, you can point out some inconsistencies. I mean, Galatians 2, verse 9, Peter's not the only person listed as appearing to be a pillar in the church. Um, you know, Matthew 16, 13 through 19, if the church was really built on Peter himself, um, uh, and if that was really connected to the church in Rome, then, you know, 
what does that make of Acts chapter 2, where you actually see the foundation of the church being in Jerusalem? Um, and even though Peter is an integral role in that, we know that the apostles all spoke on that day. So, um, you know, Peter's confession is what really mattered there in Matthew 16, not Peter himself. And then in John chapter 21, you know, we keep in mind that the, all the apostles were shared in that same responsibility. Um, John 21 again could, you know, go back to Peter denying Christ three times, uh, you know, before Christ was crucified. And, and maybe Peter's uh, re, uh, reaffirmation of the work there in John 21, you know, demonstrated to the apostles that Peter was, you know, committed or, or, or something of that nature. But you just, you, you know, you keep in mind within those passages, you know, if Peter was such a, a central figure and more important than the other apostles, then why doesn't Peter get you know, so much attention in the book of Acts. Even though he, he's important there in the early stages of the book of Acts, you know, um, you know, Paul comes really becomes a central character in chapters uh, 13 and following. Um, so if Peter's such a central character, you know, when the writers of the New Testament, the apostles are writing uh, again the New Testament, why is there not such a heavy focus on Peter if he's such a central and the most important figure within uh, the New Testament church. And then again, within the book of Romans, anytime Rome is mentioned, you really don't see Peter connected within that. And, you know, again, if Peter's such a central figure and so important to the church in Rome, you think that Paul would make mention of Peter in the book of Romans, but he does not. Um, and generally, there's, there's, there's not a lot written um, in the, the writers immediately after the New Testament about, you know, uh, necessarily Peter's importance to the city of Rome. So the, those are some things that we want to keep in mind. But it doesn't take away from the fact that when it comes to the origins of the papacy, uh, a lot of emphasis is placed on Peter uh, and how the Pope derives his authority from Peter. Uh, one of the things that developed, too, in connection with Peter was that uh, Christians would make pilgrimages to where Peter was supposedly uh, died. Uh, generally, in the second century, pilgrims that went to the city, they were sort of shown what was called to be trophies of the apostles, the tomb of Peter and the tomb of Paul. And again, sort of like Jerusalem became a, a site for Christians to, to go to to see these important places, Rome sort of had, uh, with the tomb of Peter and Paul, something similar to it. Um, obviously, within these pilgrimages too, sometimes Christians... Uh, celebrated feast days and not just martyrs, but also had a, a specific feast day dedicated to Peter. And in the 3rd century, that was generally celebrated in the city of Rome on June 29th. Uh, so Peter, Peter, Peter's importance to the city of Rome sort of grew uh, as time moved on, more so than being right there at the very beginning. Uh, again, one thing that we do want to note, though, is that at least a list of popes is not necessarily set in stone. I know in the textbook there's a list of popes, but there's some uh, debate about the authenticity of that. Um, for instance, there's some that disagree about who was the immediate successor of Peter. Some say it was Clement, some say it was Linus. And there's not a lot of clarity, at least early on, about the, the line of the popes. And that's led some historians to uh, possibly come to the conclusion that at least early on in Rome is that instead of having one bishop in charge, you had a collection of bishops in charge. And that's why you have a little bit of a discrepancy about the, the exact line of popes that followed Peter, um, which again, a, collect, a collective leadership would sort of more resemble what um, we understand to be you know, a group of elders that are, that are shepherds of the, the church. Um, well, that being said, I think that was interesting to note. That's one of the writers that, uh, that I've been reading. Uh, he pointed that out. Um, which I thought was interesting to, to note. So Peter's obviously important to the papacy. At least early on, we'll note a couple of other important moments and important figures. Another, one of those figures is, uh, is the Bishop of Rome, uh, who was uh, Victor, who was in place from 189 to 198 AD. And the thing about Victor is he's the first Latin-speaking leader of the church, because at this time most people are speaking Greek because it's the common language, but Latin was sort of the official language of the Roman Empire. Um, Victor is one of the first Latin-speaking leaders of the church. And he becomes notable for a controversy that develops that we really haven't hit on yet, 
Um, but that did get resolved at the Council of Nicaea, and that was the Easter controversy. Um, and the importance of this when it comes to the uh, Bishop of Rome becoming Pope is that this is one of the first times where the Bishop of Rome uh, begins to interject into the affairs of other congregations uh, and sort of to take on a position of leadership in that sense. So during the middle of the second century, there were some Christians that began to celebrate a festival day uh, that was about the same time as the Passover. And the word for that festival day, uh, I believe, is the Greek transliteration of Passover. Uh, and the name of it is there on your screen. It's Pash, P-A-S-C-H, um, which this day would eventually lead to the celebration of Easter as we know it today. But within this date, um, what went on is that Christians observed the suffering, the death, and the resurrection, which this is a little bit different from Easter because Easter is generally uh, you know, celebrated by some uh, in, in memory of the resurrection of Jesus. But this day was actually observing a lot more than that, the suffering, death, and resurrection. Uh, it began at the evening with a reading of Exodus chapter 12, which is the... Um, which if you go back and look at that passage, that's when the uh, first speech of the Passover, uh, at least the Old Testament Passover with the, you know, the angel of death passing over the homes of the Israelites who have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost uh, uh, and around the doorframe. We know that passage to be you know, the Passover, and that was read on this day. Uh, before the day itself, though, there was a fast that went on for about a week. And the controversy was con concerning when did the fast end? What was the specific date for the ending of the fast before the celebration of the day called Pash? P -A again, P-A-S-C-H. So there are some that said that this day, the, the fast itself, should end on the 14th day of the month, Nisan, which is, the again, the Passover. But there were others that said that, sh that it should end the following Sunday since that was the day in which Jesus was resurrected. Um, those that said that it should end on the day of the Passover were generally churches in Asia Minor and Syria, so modern-day Turkey and Syria. But the, the ones that said that it should end on the following Sunday, uh, the most Notable churches were the church in Rome, the church in Alexandria, Egypt, and the church in Jerusalem. And this controversy obviously leads to a debate. Otherwise, it's really not a controversy. And the heated debate um, uh, arises about this. And Victor thought that the other bishops were wrong. He called a meeting about it. And at the time, the meeting is not resolved. But by the Council of Nicaea, Victor's position is going to win out. Um, because the, uh, the official day of observance would become the following Sunday rather than the Passover. But again, what you see in that is the Bishop of Rome getting involved with, a, uh, with, with matters that are not just pertain to his local congregation. So again, that is, uh, that is again something new uh, that we want to point out and note. All right, so not just within that, but you also have a controversy concerning rebaptism, and this comes in the middle of the third century. As uh, what happens is you've got uh, Stephen of Rome, who's the bishop of Rome, and Cyprian of Carthage square off in this, and this all concerned about whether or not Christians who are baptized by a bishop that is not in fellowship with the mainstream church, does that person need to be rebaptized in order to uh, become part of the church once again? And Cyprian took the position that Christians must be rebaptized if they were baptized by a bishop that was not in fellowship with the mainstream church. And again, I say mainstream church. If you read other texts, um, especially scholarly texts and things like that, um, you'll see it maybe referred to Instead of saying the mainstream church, they may refer to it as the Catholic Church, but I, I just I just use the mainstream church at this point um, to to sort of indicate you know what was leading up to the Catholic Church. Um, so that was Cyprian's position. Somebody had to be rebaptized if they were baptized by a bishop that was not in fellowship, and Stephen disagreed. 
right? So you can't have controversy unless you have disagreement. Stephen disagreed with Cyprian altogether. And Rome would eventually win out. Didn't necessarily win out at the time, but uh, as time moved forward, the position of the Bishop of Rome won out. And what's interesting about this is that when Rome wins out, one of the things that Stephen does to defend his argument is that he invoked Matthew 16, 18, 19, Matthew 16, 18 uh, as part of his defense. Again, he used that verse to show that upon Peter, uh, again, not the confession, but he was using that verse to say uh, that, that Christ was saying that his authority was, Christ was establishing, establishing special authority on the successor to Peter. And that's why Stephen's argument or Stephen's position held more weight because he was the successor to Peter, but he used Matthew 16, 18 as part of his defense, which, is, which this is one of the first times where we have a written record of the Bishop of Rome using Matthew 16, 18 to defend his position as the successor of Peter and to have some type of authority greater than another bishop. And in light of all this, what happens is that uh, what this shows is that the Bishop of Rome is gaining a lot more power in the West and in North Africa, uh, at least in Carthage and in the, the territories west of Carthage. So this is very important because, in part because Rome is really the only important city connected to Christianity in the West. And the reason why he doesn't gain as much power in the East, part of, part of that we'll talk about next week, but part of that was the fact that you had multiple cities of importance in the east. Again, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople. Those are really four cities that at one point were seen as at least equals with, with the city of Rome, but they're all in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire by the middle of the fourth century. And uh, in the west, you really only have the city of Rome. That's sort of the stronghold of Christianity in the west. So, you know, Rome doesn't have a lot of competition in terms of you know, uh, maintaining their power. And so that's just sort of a, a regional factor that, that sort of help illustrates that, you know, um, Rome doesn't have a lot of competition for power in the West like it would have if it had been in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. Uh, certainly with the origins of the papacy, another thing we, we keep in mind is, again, Constantine accepting and converting to Christianity immediately results in a lot of good benefits for the city of Rome and the bishop of Rome. Again, more resources are diverted to building churches. The churches become more elaborate. And again, Rome is really the first city that, that gets the, uh, the first benefits of that. I know later on Constantine moves to moves his capital to Constantinople. Um, but initially, Rome received a lot of the, the initial privileges of, of Constantine tolerating Christianity. We also want to keep in mind the aftermath of the Nicene Council. So again, we've talked about uh, that with the Nicene Council, what was agreed upon is that Jesus was deity and that God the Father, Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all three in one, uh, whereas the Arians, the you know, the A- R-I-A-N-S, Arians, they uh, held to the belief that Jesus was actually lesser than God the Father. We know that uh, with the Nicene Council, the idea of three and one wins out. And within this, at least beforehand, the Bishop of Rome was generally uh, remained on the sidelines. Uh, but again, he got more involved with that, which again reflects a, a pattern of the Bishop of Rome uh, stepping in and, and exerting more authority. And what happens in that aftermath is generally the West is in, a, in agreement about the Nicene Council. At least they accept the decision that was made there. But again, the East did not always remain consistent. Right? Constantine sort of supported the Nicene Council, but he himself is baptized by an Arian bishop who was on the opposite end. Uh, his son, uh, uh, Constantius, uh, is, uh, is, is a emperor who supported the Arians, which was different from the Nicene Council. So they, in the East, they waver over that a little bit. But in the West, there was general agreement supporting the Nicene Council. Well, as part of that process, there was a man in the East named Athanasius who 
was supportive of the decisions of the Nicene Council. And he is sort of dismissed from his position by the Arian Emperor, which I believe was uh, Constantius II. I'd have to go back and look that up. Um, but the, the Emperor was an, uh, was an Arian, right? He didn't believe Christ was uh, deity. Um, so Athanasius leaves the east and he moves to the west and he's accepted in the west because he favored the decision that was made at the Nicene Council. Um, and the bishop of Rome at the time, whose name was Julius, sort of welcomed him with open arms. And there were attempts to try to get this issue resolved between the west and the east over this, really this doctrinal matter. And so there was a new council that was called to handle the, handle the matter in, in the city of Sardica, uh, which is in modern-day Bulgaria. And I will I'll pull up a map just to look at that real quick because we really haven't talked about this location yet. Um, if I can get that to load... Good thing about this website, you have a lot of maps. Again, this is the University of Texas. Um, University of Texas map. Let's see if this map has it. Uh, so here's Bulgaria. Um, I believe the city of Sofia is sort of right here in central Bulgaria. Um, so this is sort of the place that we're talking about. This would have been in the confines of the Eastern Roman Empire where this is, uh, where this Councils being held to resolve the issue between um, the Nicene Christians in the west and the Arians in the east. And again, what comes of this I uh, get my nose pulled up. Uh, again, what comes of this is that the the Eastern bishops who are Arians don't want to have anything to do with this council because Athanasius would be present. And so, in response, the bishops in the West, who are generally in agreement, they just decide to call a council together and they uh, approve Athanasius to be a bishop. And both sides sort of uh, excommunicate each other, uh, at least for a time being. Um, but the importance of all this is that the Bishop of Rome is given a new position because of the Council of Bishops in the West. They agree to grant the Bishop of Rome uh, a new position. And what this position was is that the Bishop of Rome would essentially serve as a court of appeals. Um, some have called this an appellate jurisdiction that the Bishop of Rome had. Um, so. The way that it would work is that in the West, if there was a dispute among churches, the Bishop of Rome could be called in to sort of be the judge of the matter. And so now the Bishop of Rome, from the decision of this council, um, now was given a, a position where it was expected of him to sort of be the judge in matters uh, resolving disputes among churches in the West. And so this is new for the Bishop of Rome. This is all part of the process of how the Bishop of Rome is increasingly acquiring more religious power as time begins to move on. Um, so very important to remember. Um, and it's going to become within the 5th uh, and 6th centuries where the position of the Bishop of Rome, he's going to move from just being a judge to also becoming a teacher uh, for other congregations or for other churches as we'll, we'll know going forward. There's also another Pope that come, or another Bishop of Rome um, I may use those two terms interchangeably, um, but Damasus becomes the Bishop of Rome. And with the death of Constantine and with, you know, we talked about Julian the Apostate who didn't like Christianity, um, the construction of Christian Rome fell into the hands of Damasus uh, as, the Eastern, as the Emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire was more confined to his territory. Uh, Damasus was a native of Rome. He's elected as bishop in 366. Uh, Damasus is also one who loved, uh, who was an intellectual. Uh, he was trained as a scholar. He loved the arts. Uh, he loved poetry. And as part of this, he goes about building uh, new churches and uh, shrines that are very elaborate 
uh, that sort of honored martyr, martyrs. And some of these shrines were overlaid in gold. Uh, some had precious stones uh, as part of the monument. And Damasus is one who, who goes about trying to construct a Christian Rome. Again, Constantinople was Constantine's vision of a Christian city, a Christian capital, because he didn't feel that Rome itself was very Christian at all. Um, but Damascus is going to try to make Rome into to a city that is, is inherently Christian. And as part of this, he gains an influence among the nobility to help out this process. Uh, he sort of gets the church and the, the rich, wealthy families in the city uh, to, to have a good relationship. Um, these the nobility of Rome were often the ones that were most connected to the uh, Roman culture. Um, if you thought about what it meant to be a Roman, you'd look to the elite in the city, and, and they were sort of t thought of to be a representative of what the uh, uh, of what the Roman culture looked like. Well, Damascus went about trying to establish a good relationship between both sides, which he's fairly which he's fairly. Uh, uh, he, 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 uh, he's fairly, uh, I can't even think of the word, he's fairly successful in what he's doing there. Um, and what happens is that you've got a distinct Roman Christian culture that develops in the city. Uh, and this comes from a couple of things. One, well, really, is one of the things that helps out in this is obviously Damascus' in involvement. Um, but at the same time, what happens in this relationship is that the elite begin to become closer not just to the church but to the bishop of rome and so in the centuries that follow from this the pope and the pa the papacy those surrounded surrounding the pope uh, as one writer put sort of most closely resemble the ancient roman empire moving forward because the pope becomes so connected to the nobility and the nobility are generally more connected to Rome's past than the other groups in the city. And so the papacy uh, often sort of portrays Rome's past in a way. Um, and, and so Damascus is, is successful. He gets the Roman pagans to sort of switch their piety from, again, Rome's religion to Christianity. And part of this is helped out by the bishop of Rome getting a man named Jerome to write the Latin Vulgate, which is the which is not necessarily the first Latin version of the Bible, but uh, one of the one of the most important versions of um, uh, of the La uh, of a Bible translated into Latin. Um, the versions beforehand, it was said that were very crude, maybe not as well written. But now that you have the Latin Vulgate, which, which translates the Bible into the official language of the Roman Empire, which was well known by the elite in Rome, now the elite have their own Bible that is sort of um, what, what was written in the language that they were most accustomed with. And so, again, Damascus is involved in the process. He's the one that gets Jerome to write this. And so uh, you start to see that tie between the elite in the city with the Bishop of Rome. And this this will help obviously with political power, but it also helps with religious power uh, uh, as we see moving forward. Now, we'll talk about this next week, but Damascus all, almost loses his influence among the people um, by the Council of Constantinople, which we'll talk more about that council next week. Um, but still, uh, again, this is a growing gradual process. Uh, that, that's being portrayed here. You've also got what's called the papal letters. Um, and again, these are just letters from the Bishop of Rome. And they sort of begin with a man named Sericius, who is the bishop that immediately comes after Damascus. And these letters uh, sort of help settle disputes in a way. Um, and the way that it had worked, obviously, is that you know the bishop could be called upon to be a judge in the matter. But now it's more of the, the bishop of Rome uh, is more active, a little bit more aggressive in handling church disputes in terms of you know not waiting for someone to call on him, but immediately getting himself involved. 
Uh, this is sort of what is important about these letters that were written by some of the bishops, uh, which began again with Sericius. So in 385, uh, there's a bishop named Himerius who sends a letter to uh, Sericius, and he's got some questions about how baptism should be administered. He's got questions about how, um, uh, again, the, the qualifications for ordination. He's got questions about whether or not church clergy should remain celibate or, or unmarried. And Sericius responds in a letter of his own, but the letter itself was sort of written in the style of what would be called or what would be viewed as an imperial decree. And so within the content of the letter, there are a few things that we want to point out that are interesting. So first of all, you see that Sericius, um, first of all, within the letter, Sericius begins by stating that he is the successor of Peter and that he shares a, a more serious responsibility in the matter. Um, and he used the term we maybe to refer to not just himself, but also Peter as well in terms of handling this decision. And again, he within referring to himself as a successor to Peter, refers back to Matthew 16, 18. Um, so he goes and he addresses the questions that were involved. And then he interestingly notes within that that it was proper for Himerius to get the bishop of Rome involved to be consulted in the matter, all, as, though, as though it was necessary for that process to be completed. Um, so, uh, in, in a way, Sericius is commending uh, Himerius for doing the right thing by looking to the Bishop of Rome as the authority in the matter. Uh, obviously, you see the religious power increasing, uh, as evident by this letter. And after the matter has been settled, Sericius says that the letter should be distributed to other churches in the area for them to follow that rule, which, uh, again, is you know, reflective of the, the idea that the bishop was sort of held the same authority as the apostles. You keep in mind in the book of Colossians, Paul sort of does the same thing. He writes a letter to the church in Colossae, but he also tells the Christians there that the, that the letter should be distributed in other Christians to be read, uh, in other churches to be read. And so, um, sort of a similar thing's going on here uh, with the letter from Sericius. Uh, the papal letters themselves, uh, you know, they weren't just thrown away, but they were often kept and they would uh, be collected. And so what this, what, what happens is these letters are collected and it sort of forms a body of law that the bishops are essentially passing down and in which other bishops later on could draw from these writings to, to make decisions. And so... Um, it's, it's although the, the writings of the bishops are, are becoming extremely authoritative. Um, and by the fact that other bishops are responding and, and following their orders shows that the Bishop of Rome at this point has a lot of religious power, at least in the West. We also want to talk about uh, Innocent the I and Augustine. And keep in mind that one of the things that Augustine had to deal with was uh, a man named Pelagius who'd come from Britain and settled in Rome. And Again, we keep in mind that Pelagius and one of his followers uh, sort of uh, held to the idea that someone was not necessarily born into sin, like Augustine uh, seemed to believe, um, which we've noted that before. So Augustine, when he's trying to settle this matter, he actually writes to the Bishop of Rome for uh, affirmation of a rebuke of Pelagius. And Innocent actually sees this as Augustine recognizing uh, the Bishop of Rome as the final authority in the matter, um, which Augustine may not necessarily have intended in the letter, but this is how Innocent the first saw it, uh, who, who again is the Bishop of Rome. Um, and this is what he said uh, in response to Augustine. Uh, he said, Nothing should be taken as finally settled unless it came to the notice of this see referring to the Bishop of Rome, so that other churches might learn from this what they should teach. So, again, what's being emphasized there, nothing should be taken as final, finally settled unless it came to the notice of the Bishop of Rome. So the Bishop of Rome, at this point, 
at least for innocent, innocent the first, he's the final authority. He's the final say in any doctrinal matter. And so this letter is evidence that at this point, the Bishop of Rome is the most important figure in the, uh, in, in the church in, the, in Western Europe, in the eyes of the bishop. Um, and as one writer said, at this point, the office of the judge that the Bishop of Rome had you know, um, back during the time of Victor, at this point, by the middle of the 5th century, um, the Bishop of Rome is not just the judge in matters of the Western Church, but he's also, in some ways, the teacher and the, uh, uh, we might could say, the writer of new doctrine for, for churches in the West. Um, and that's sort of how the Bishop of Rome gains his political power uh, there's some more things that we're going to note going forward. Um, and again, the second lecture video, we'll talk about how he gains his uh, political power more so uh, than religious power. But this sort of is half of the story about how the, the Bishop of Rome is increasing in power. And as we'll see going forward, this religious power is important because it's then going to translate to political power as well, which sort of brings us up to date with the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Well, that being said, we'll go ahead and stop here, but thank you for your time and attention. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to, free, feel free to get in contact with us.